When John returned, I was glad to have him back, but his drug-taking hadn't stopped, and too often he was lost to me. Still, I clung to the times when he was his old self, hoping that the real, loving John would return. One morning at breakfast, he pointed out an article in the newspaper to me. It was about a Japanese artist, Yoko Ono, who had made a film that consisted of close-up shots of people's bottoms. Sin, you've got to look at this. I mean, it must be a joke. Christ, what next? She can't be serious. We laughed and shook our heads. Mad, John said. She must be off her rocker. I had to agree. We had no understanding at all of avant-garde art or conceptualism at that point, and the newspaper went into the bin. We didn't discuss Yoko Ono again until one night when we were lying in bed reading. I asked John what his book was. It was called Grapefruit and looked very short. Oh, something that weird artist woman sent me, he said. I didn't know you'd met her. John looked up. Yeah, I went to her exhibition. John Dunbar asked me. It was nutty. John Dunbar, ex-husband of Mick Jagger's girlfriend, Marianne Faithful, was a friend of his who owned a small art gallery in central London, the Indica. It wasn't unusual for John Dunbar to invite friends to one of his exhibitions. I didn't think any more about it. In February 1967, the Beatles released Strawberry Fields Forever by John and Penny Lane by Paul, the double A-side about their old haunts in Liverpool. Penny Lane had been a central area, almost like a little village, close to John, Paul and George's homes. They often met, shopped or caught the bus there. Strawberry Fields was the name of a children's home in Woolton, close to Mimi's house. John had passed its red sandstone walls many times and loved the name. The single reached number one, but it failed to go straight to the top. The first since Please Please Me. Were they slipping? Was it the fans' reaction to the end of live performing? We could only wait and see. For the next few months, the four worked hard in the studio, and the result in the summer was a new album, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Some of the tracks on it referred to or were written under the influence of drugs, but its flowery, dreamy style perfectly suited the mood of the nation. It was the midst of the flower power era, when hippies, flowers, love and peace were the themes. Psychedelia was everywhere, mini skirts were in vogue, and everyone headed for Carnaby Street, the hippie fashion mecca, for a kaftan or a string of love beads. At this point he had been at home with us for nine months, and I was having to face the fact that things between us were no better. John was still taking drugs almost daily and was unconnected, distant, moody and unpredictable. I was having to look after Julian and keep the house running on my own. John was in another world. Almost miraculously, a motivation to quit drugs appeared in the form of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. In the midst of this summer of flower power, George and Patty had become absorbed in Indian spiritual beliefs. Patty had been trying to teach herself to meditate, but was finding it hard going until she went to a lecture about transcendental meditation at Caxton Hall, held by the Spiritual Regeneration Movement. She decided to join, and in August she heard that the movement's leader, the Maharishi, was coming from India to run a summer conference in Bangor, North Wales. A couple of days before the conference he would speak at the Hilton, George and she decided to go, and urged us all to join them. I stayed at home, but John went, with George, Patty, Paul, Jane and Ringo. When he came home, he was excited. It's fantastic stuff, Sin. The meditation so simple and it's life-changing. Along with the others, he'd been bowled over by the Maharishi's charisma and his promises of nirvana. The Maharishi had invited the Beatles to go to his Bangor conference, which was to last ten days, beginning on the August bank holiday weekend. John was keen and I was happy to go along and find out what it was all about. George, Patty, her sister Jenny and Paul were all going. Ringo decided at the last minute that he'd come too. Maureen had just given birth to their second son Jason and was still in hospital.
Also along for the ride was a young Greek, Alex Mardas. He'd been introduced to us by John Dunbar, who thought his electronics expertise might be useful to the Beatles. He soon became known as Magic Alex and joined the Beatles' inner circle, making himself indispensable both in and out of the studio. The Maharishi was anti-drugs and had explained that through meditation you could reach a natural high as powerful as any drugs could induce. John loved this idea and was already talking about enlightenment, cosmic awareness and doing without drugs. So I was all for the Maharishi's message. Perhaps this was the change of direction John had been looking for and perhaps this time I could share it with him. When we reached the Bangor Conference that August, the Beatles held a press conference renouncing the use of drugs, in keeping with the Maharishi's teachings. Only a month earlier, they, along with a string of other pop stars, had taken a full-page ad in the Times stating that the law on marijuana was unworkable and immoral. Paul had admitted publicly that he had tried LSD, and it was well known that the others had too. Now all that was turned on its head. The press were wildly excited. But the boys' announcement had barely hit the newsstands when it was overtaken by news of an appalling tragedy. As we were heading back to our room, a reporter told us that Brian Epstein, who had steered the Beatles for the past six years, had been found dead. The details we had at that point were sketchy. It had been a suspected overdose. It was possible that Brian had killed himself. This was horrific. Not only had he died at the age of just 32, but in circumstances that meant there would have to be an investigation. That afternoon we drove home. In the car, John and I held hands, trying to give each other strength. Every now and then John would mutter, Oh Christ, why? Why Brian? I just can't get it into my head. He was as low as he had been after Stuart's death, and Brian's passing was yet another sudden loss. For the Beatles, it was the end of a hugely important chapter in their lives. We had to wait twelve days for the inquest to announce a verdict on Brian's death. When we heard it had been accidental, we wept with relief. But a picture of Brian's last days emerged that left us sad and guilty. After the Beatles had stopped touring a year earlier, they had had less day-to-day contact with Brian. A large part of his job had been organising their appearances and tours. So although he was still their manager, and there was still regular contact between them, it was not at the same level. Of course he had other acts to manage, but the Beatles were always his raison d'etre. The end of touring had evidently left a hole in his life. In addition, none of us had known how prone to depression Brian was. It seems he had suffered from depressive episodes for many years, and he had been depressed during the months before he died. Latterly, he had rarely got up before lunchtime. Sometimes he went into his office in the afternoon, but more often he didn't, and his work had suffered. Just over a month before his death, his father Harry had died, which might have fueled his depression. His mother Queenie had been staying with him recently, and he'd made a huge effort to comfort and reassure her, getting up to have breakfast with her, then spending a normal day in the office, and coming home to her in the evening. She had left on the Thursday, three days before Brian died. He had planned to spend that bank holiday weekend at his country house with friends. But when most of them had to cancel, he had driven back to London late in the evening. His body had been found the next day, when the live-in couple who worked for him, Antonio and Maria, had become worried. His bedroom door had been locked, so they had called his secretary, then a doctor. Eventually the door was forced, and he was found dead in his bed. Police had found 17 bottles of pills in Brian's house. He had been on large quantities of antidepressants and sleeping pills for some time. He was taking more of them than he was supposed to and died not from a massive overdose, but from a series of smaller, unintentional ones that had led to a build-up of drugs in his system 
The conclusion was that he had been careless in taking the drugs, but had not intended to kill himself. We were certain that that was right. Apart from anything else, Brian would never have put his beloved mother through more grief so soon after the loss of his father.' 